Hi folks, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. I've had so much interest in the gasifier, uh, gas producing wood stove here, that I'm going to take you with some of this equipment you see here and a little bit more, uh, step by step how to build a much bigger unit. We're going to go ahead and incorporate a couple other things, uh, energy producing devices, uh, new ways to burn the wood, uh, different things in here that I've learned throughout my process of working with synthetic gas and gasification. Uh, these parts that you see here on the right, we have a propane powered uh, hot water heater system that I've gutted all the bottom out, which I'll show you up close. The thing I like about those is they already have a welded tube going right through the center of the hot water heater tank. So I'll show you later what we're going to use that for. The centerpiece there, that is a dishwasher. Heavy metal outside old dishwasher case. I've stripped it all down. We're going to go ahead and use that for the main fire box for the wood stove itself. Uh, over here you see the 55 gallon drum that we're going to take and put into the actual bio crude reactor and gasification reactor. It's a sealed can so it'll actually have uh, no oxygen present in that environment and produce the materials that we're looking for. The two long pieces of pipe here will actually use more than this. I bought a bunch of these. These are two inch in diameter, quarter inch thick. I'll show you the end. Uh, quarter inch thick pieces of pipe. This should allow us uh, plenty of pressure resistance. It's also going to allow us to be able to burn these uh, once they've plugged up in the end. Sooner or later throughout using this system you will plug up the pipes and you're going to want to be able to clean that catalyst because iron is a catalyst for synthetic gas. You want to be able to clean that tube out and you're going to be able to do that by burning them. Uh, set them over a campfire or a large bonfire. So what we're going to do now is go ahead and encase uh, this hot or dishwasher, I'm sorry. We're going to encase it. It's already got a rim. Let me show you up close here. It's got an extruded rim here sticking out, protruding out. We're going to go ahead and case that around with metal so we have an air gap between this and our outer case. So this will actually become our burn cylinder here, our actual burn chamber. Uh, the old hole here in the top, I'm going to actually have to take, put an uh, air valve here, close that up and open up a door here. So we can actually feed this large furnace uh, wood down below the actual reactor barrel. The reactor barrel is going to sit up above right here. It's actually going to lay down. I'll show you real quickly here. I'll just put it together dry. We're going to have a big case like you see on this other stove in the background, the large case going up around it uh, so that it can funnel all the heat. And at the very top of that, we're probably going to end up putting this hot water heater tank. Uh, so that the end flue uh, heat that's coming out of this whole wood stove has to travel through that center pipe, which I'll show you right here, coming out through the top of this hot water heater tank. Trying to make effective use of every bit of the heat we're producing in the wood stove itself. And then in the end, the new process that I've discovered on how to convert this uh, bio crude and the synthesis gas that's coming out of here, I'll share that with you and that will kind of revolutionize how synthetic gas or synthesis gas is being produced and how we refine it. Uh, the stuff you see up on the top is another addition to this system. What you see here is one of these large heat sinks, this large black one here, flipped upside down. I've already got four thermoelectric generator chips sitting on that. Oops, there we go. It's a little unsteady. But we have the four thermoelectric generator chips sitting there ready to go. I'm going to apply another four to this one. Uh, and then we also have a smaller heat sink here for this smaller tag system, which is more of a, uh, it's going to be a power sensor and small, small power producer at certain times. That'll be part of the system. Uh, also, we have here another five tag devices, thermoelectric generators. I had to go get these ones new. I've been using my old ones for quite a while in different experiments to see how well they work. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and incorporate all these on that other large heat sink here. We'll have the large, smaller one on this heat sink and these will be going into a whole other part of this stove that I'll share with you later as we start to build it. Uh, these are a little expensive so they're not cheap to buy. They were about $45 a piece. Uh, I bought them in bulk so I bought quite a bit of them. Uh, so they're, they're not cheap but they do produce some usable power. They're not going to be the best for directly charging batteries but what we're going to use them for in this system they're going to work just fine. So let me go ahead and start setting this up, start putting this together uh, and then once I get the first stages built I'll show you more. Hope you enjoyed. Hi folks, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. I want to take you through part one of building the ISIS gasifier system that will produce 
three different kinds of liquid fuels in the end. Hopefully we can achieve that out of easily obtained parts. Uh, it'll also heat your home, heat your hot water. It'll run a generator and power a propane powered refrigerator. All is a large volume system. What you see here in front of you is a outer metal core to an old dishwasher. It's a uh, thick enough metal that I can use it for the inner burn chamber. It's not going to be a super long term system, but you'll get a few years out of something like this. Uh, you can see I've already drilled holes all the way across here, at least on three sides on the top and the bottom. Uh, those are five sixteenths inch drill holes every inch and a half spacing all the way across here. You'll notice that goes all the way around the system. All right, and not in the front though here, which I'll show you in just a minute here. I got to put that in. What I'm going to end up doing, what it is, is I'm going to actually end up having a feed pipe, an actual tube running inside of this. Uh, just because the way this was designed, I didn't want to change anything else. I'm going to run a tube with holes drilled, the same 5 16 holes, all the way across. And that tube will actually be drawing its air from this channel right here. If you see this recessed channel, that tube will be running up this channel and going across here. And that'll be an air supply across this front face, both at the top and at the bottom. Now the bottom holes are 3 8 inch holes. And I highly doubt that's going to be enough holes to give us what we're going to need for the uh, burn system here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and fire it up with this just to see what the burn condition is. And from here I'm going to start adding holes. Uh, probably both another set of holes all the way across the rim here just above these ones. And possibly another set of holes here in the center somewhere. Or an air feed here. I'm going to have a trap door so we can dump this out when it's all ashed down to a catch down below. So probably this is a little off on perspective here. Probably the air holes are going to come in somewhere around in here. Uh, possibly with a uh, slight adjust air feed in the center if it's necessary. This is a lot more wood in this system so I'm going to have to go through and just each one of them is kind of independent on how big the, the box is on just how much air flow you're going to need to get a kind of the perfect burn. You can either get it going too fast or you can get it going so it's not burning well enough. So let's go ahead here in just a moment. I'm going to fire this up with a bunch of wood in it. We're going to see how well it burns with just that first ring of holes in there. It's going to dirty the thing pretty bad which I don't really like. So the rest of the time I'm working with it I'm just going to be covered in soot. Uh, but anyways that's part of the uh, process of getting this right. So let me go ahead and put some wood in this. I'll fire it up and show you what it looks like. Alright folks I've got it filled with wood. Uh, it's a windy day so this may not be a real good demonstration of what's going on here. I quickly put up some metal slats on either side of it here. Just extend it out so there's kind of an air gap between the actual firebox and an outer wall, which helps create some of the airflow between it. When this is finally cased off, the airflow will be much stronger than what we'll see today. So I've done that, now I've got a bunch of wood in here, ready to light it. I've got a pile of little sticks on top, and I've got quite a bit of bigger wood down through there. So let's go ahead and just hit this with the lighter real quick and see how it works. Alright, let's see if we got it going. So there we go, I had a little piece of toilet paper right there, just kind of as a quick start measure. Alright, already the fire is starting to hit some wood. So what I'm going to do now is just go ahead and set down the camera back on the tripod. We're going to take a view of this thing and just see how well it works. Uh, this would be a poor day to demonstrate this because of the wind. If it was a nice calm day, you'd see a lot more effectively how this is going to uh, work today. So hopefully I'll be able to uh, show this on a non-windy day. Alright, it's been burning for a few moments here, just kind of spreading through the small brush. You can see already there's a gasification effect taking place. If I get down even here, you'll see how tall the flames actually are. And very little smoke. You'll notice that there's almost no smoke coming out of the top of that system, so already it's begun to consume some of that smoke and make it into actually flame, a usable heat source for us. Alright, so slowly here this is heating up. This will take a little bit. It wasn't a full load of wood which would have performed much better. You can see there some smoke coming out as the wind gusts into it improperly and changes the airflow dynamics inside the stove. So here we go. Now it's starting to gasify a bit. Those flames are really clear, so they may be difficult on film to see. But they're now starting to reach pretty high. Alright, so now we have the syngas actually burning. You can actually see some of the actual fire that's just 
appearing up here at the very top. Uh, it means that the airflow is actually mixing pretty properly. It's creating almost a smokeless flame with, well, well reaching good four feet in height coming out of there. That's pretty good for the uh, size of the box. The sheer volume of energy though that I can feel from the heat that's coming out of there, those some six foot flames starting to roll now. You can definitely tell that gasification is taking place inside the wood stove when the wind's not affected. All right, now that we've seen the burn, looks like it's pretty effective. Seems to be uh, producing a pretty clean burn, especially for as little wood as I put in there. You can see how quickly that reduced down to a very small fraction in the bottom. Seems to be burning still very well for a small amount of wood, producing large volumes of heat off of this thing. It's almost like standing in front of a sun, even outside right now. Uh, another thing about this is if you notice, it's also the world's only smokeless campfire. You can actually build yourself a nice gasifier campfire ring and nobody around the uh, fire is actually sitting in the smoke. Kind of a pleasant thing to do when you're out camping. Uh, so what I'm going to do now, now that I've seen that the burn is pretty much what I'm looking for, I'm going to probably add one more set of holes in at the bottom, uh, down here at the bottom line all the way around. That'll be for burning up the biochar in the end once the uh, synthetic gas is done being produced and used up by the stove you get a biochar burn and you need to open up more oxygen into that system to get that biochar to burn properly or at any kind of fast rate otherwise it'll lock. Alright we've been burning for about 20 minutes now. Uh, that was a very little pile of wood. For mostly it was small branches, some bigger twigs in there. And you can tell we're still producing a large amount of energy out of this. Uh, whenever the wind stops kicking it to one side you'll watch it just rear up out of there. Once the entire system is encased in we won't have that issue and that'll be a giant column of flame running up past our bio crude reactor system. But I thought I'd give you just a moment here just watching this burn. Uh, maybe we'll get some shots here when the wind stops affecting it so much. You actually see just how uh, big of a flame cluster that really is. There you go, that's a pretty good shot there for a moment. Watching the entire top roll with that big hot flame. Alright, so I thought I'd just throw this in there just to kind of give you a, a quick moment just to watch the actual burn cycle. And if, like I keep saying, the wind is actually the biggest effect that you see taking place for an uneven burn right now. Alright, we are now half an hour into the burn. I just wanted to show you what's still taking place in here. Uh, we should be entering down into about the coal gas burn stage right now, uh, which is more of a carbon monoxide gas burn, and that'll actually start turning blue. Once the orange disappears and you start seeing a, a blue flame, which is very difficult in the daytime to see, it's more of a nighttime thing that you witness, uh, that'll actually be the coal gas. That coal gas is the cleanest of all the sin gases that we produce in this system. It's the best for actually running the engines. It uh, doesn't produce the best for, for the gas production or the refinery, but it does produce the best for directly running a generator. Very little tar present in coal gas. And here very soon, that'll actually burn all the way down and most of those orange flames will disappear and it'll go into a, basically a charcoal uh, blue flame burn just above the material itself. But you'll notice even a half an hour into this, we're still producing a large volume of flame inside of there and it's all wicking to one side due to the fact the wind's coming across from this way, hitting that back wall, rushing down against the bottom and forcing everything back against the top again. There's also a venturi over the top that's happening to draw the flame off the top there also. So that's why you actually see it only burning towards one direction right now. And as the wind changes, you'll notice it changes also its position there. Now I don't know if you can tell from that angle, but those are still reaching quite a ways out of the box. Uh, so this is still a very usable system. Uh, this looks like it's going to work for what I'm trying to do heat wise. If I put a full load of big wood in there, that should burn for quite a long time. Hopefully producing just the burn time I need to fully biochar the, uh, the gasification or oil reactor, the bio crude system. Uh, that requires a specific amount of time and heat to get that process to produce the correct elements that we're going to want to refine. 
Uh, other processes produce small amounts of these elements. It's just getting that process and the heat and everything, the timing of the burn, just right to produce the largest quantity of the usable extracts that we're looking for out of the, almost the 2,000 that are present within bio crude oil. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Tesalonian, the Tesalonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. I want to take you through uh, the next step in the ISIS gasifier system. What you see in front of you down there in the bottom of the gasifier barrel, you can tell this is the main burn barrel, the one we just did the test fire on. Uh, this is going to be a main key piece to how this system works. It's one of the new modifications that I've made to the production models that's different than what you saw in the other video. Uh, I'm going to pull this out of here and show you it, but I want to tell you first what it's going to do. It has two uh, purposes here. First of all, that is an airflow that's going to feed air directly into the center bottom of the mass of wood. If I stand back up here and show you, that is at the very bottom of the wood stove itself. Uh, that is about an inch and a half piece of uh, chrome covered exhaust muffler pipe, which I'll show you what it looked like here in a second. It comes all the way out the other side right here. So there's our output right there, or our input. Uh, and underneath this, what this is actually is a uh, centerpiece that was twice this long to a barbecue grill. It actually had a propane burner for a propane powered barbecue sitting underneath this with these air vents already in it. Uh, what this is going to do for us is that it's going to feed fresh air down into the bottom of our gasifier right in the middle of the mix of wood. It also, once you've burned off the most of the actual smoke that's coming out of this and you've built up a large pile of biochar and that biochar is burning, you can actually now reverse the flow through this and biochar wants to burn in a different direction uh, than the actual gasification burn. You can actually reverse the direction and start up a generator. This will be our first generator output in the system which will actually have three generator outputs or three different stages in, in the single burn process that you can actually run a generator at. And this is going to be our first stage actually in the fireplace itself. Uh, this basically could be used without the upper uh, reservoir tank or the reactor tank could be used to uh, power a generator directly off the gasifier wood stove itself not needing the rest of the bio crude system that I'm going to show you here attached to this. Uh, so anyways let me go ahead and pull that out of there show you kind of what it looks like. I wanted to do this before I welded it all in. Alright so if we pull that up into the sunlight here you can see what that looks like and I've got an air gap that's the curled end of a piece of exhaust pipe from a motorcycle uh, and it's got an air gap of about a inch, inch and a half right there uh, between the top of the plate, the actual uh, separator plate. What this will do is allow all the char to sit on top of it like this. Air can draw through the holes but it's very difficult for material to get down and back up underneath there to suck into our pipe. You will get some, but it'll be a lot less than if you didn't do this. Uh, so that's basically what it is. You can see I have one little bolt welded there to keep the distance exact. I've welded it right there. Very simple piece. It's all made out of stainless up there. This top piece is. Uh, this is just chrome covered steel, which you'd want stainless if you want to make this a lasting system. So basically that's all you're doing. You're just creating an air gap between the end of that pipe. and You kind of want the pipe to curl up just like this. This is the perfect piece for it. That's why I used it. Uh, and that way the air will draw from the top of the little chamber in there and not down at the bottom of the holes where all the ash and the biochar will be building up. So there you go. That's our simplest piece here in the center. That's going to actually be able, just this alone, once you fill this with biochar, and even I think while you're running it as a standard gasifier stove, you could shut down the top flue output to a certain degree and then turn on your generator and this should still run even with a full load of fresher wood. Uh, so let me go ahead and uh, insert this into the gasifier now. And uh, also, here's our next step. Is in the bottom of this. I have now got to cut the bottom of the whole thing out here. And I'm trying to decide right now exactly at what one of these rings I'm going to cut this out. It's obviously easier to dump the ash that's going to build up in here from the outer ring all the way out. If I cut right here at this outer ring all the way around, this should be a pretty good sized dump plate and that should allow for easy cleaning of the stove. Uh, that's possibly what I'm going to do. I may come into this line right here and actually go across this line. Uh, I'm going to do some measurements and see exactly what I want to mess with here and how much structural integrity I'll take from the stove if I cut too far out. Uh, so let me go ahead and do the cuts there and I'll show you exactly how to set up your hinged bottom so you can dump the ash out of this without having to flip the gasifier over like in standard gasifiers. So give me a moment to set that up. 
Hi folks, okay, so what we're working on here today is the dump bottom door gasifier ISIS wood stove system. You can see I've got the actual burn chamber itself flipped upside down. Uh, what I have here is just crudely set into place before I weld everything and get this all set up to show you what we're going to do for our dump bottom. Uh, what this is over here is just a piece of stainless steel tubing riding on a large nail. I'm still going to cut the head off of this nail with the grinder, but that's actually going to be our hinge. That'll actually, the stainless tube will weld to the stove itself. Uh, the nail that sticks out either side of this, there we go, uh, will actually have a brace from it welded to the bottom of the stove that'll actually run a long ways across the bottom of this plate, helping with the rigidity of the plate because there's a lot of heat that builds up right in this area against the bottom of the stove. It also have a brace off of this part of the nail going to the bottom of the stove here, the dump plate. Uh, so let me take that out of there real quick and show you what we've got here. So obviously you can see this is a nice thick piece of eighth inch iron. Underneath that you can see the hole that I've cut in the bottom of the stove. And on top of this piece of iron, there's the piece that I cut out of the stove itself. Uh, I left that on there, it's just added, like I keep saying, rigidity to this system. There's a lot of heat right here, so you want to make sure this is nice and tough. Uh, you're going to want to build it, if you're going to buy materials to build this system, you're going to want to build this out of quarter inch steel. Uh, hopefully even out of stainless if you, if you can afford it. But that'll actually sit right there, creating a really nice seal all the way around the sides, all the way around when this is closed. So most of our airflow has to go through the actual designated ports that we've designed and put into the system. So let me go ahead and build the hinge here. I'm going to weld that all together and set that up and I'll show you from there how we're going to build the release and the lever to allow this to dump from the outside of the wood stove. Alright folks, so here's where we are now. I've got my hinge built. It's welded onto our plate. You can see I chopped another one of those nails up and just gave me an extension a little less than halfway out into the plate here. I can now open up the door. It sits on the hinge nicely there. So there we go. That's an easy way to build a hinged bottom opening piece here so we can dump our ash out of this system, uh, which is pretty key to keeping it running properly. So let me go ahead and start building some of the latch system, uh, the release that goes outside of this, and we're going to put the case around the wood stove. All right, folks, I've got the bottom ash dump door basically completed. The rest of the work on this will take place outside of the outer skin for this. Uh, so let me go ahead and just show you what we've got done here. You can see I've got a stainless piece of pipe coming out right here all the way out. That's our actual dump plate lever. Uh, we've got some reinforcement pieces here welded to it. I put a reinforcement nail across the front lip here and tack welded it on both sides all the way down just to give it so this lip won't fold or bend or warp and keep a much better seal when we're getting this hot. Uh, the little piece of L stock here that I've put in just to mount all this off of. And you'll notice the distance here and elevation I had to achieve to get it so that when you pull this arm over, it doesn't buck right against this and stop immediately. The closer you put your hinge to the edge, the less of a riser you're going to have to design to make that functioning. So let me go ahead and just actuate this lever, switch hands with the camera here. Let me go ahead and actuate this lever. You can see I'm just putting my hand on the edge here. It'll actuate and dump the door nicely. It's got a nice little counter lever action going to it because of the angles. Makes it easy to actuate. So there we go. We're now hinged. We've got a uh, bottom dump door. It's double insulated here. Two pieces of steel with a hollow air gap with some insulation material between it. In this high rise section here you see at the end of my finger. Uh, so this will give us some pretty good heat resistance, some reinforcement. And now once we get the case on we'll be able to add our outer uh, actuation lever for this. So this will be actually moved from the outside of the case by your little hand lever. So there you go. Here's most of the work done now. I've got a little bit of legs to mount to this. I've got some uh, here and there stuff and I'll show you those before we finish the casing. All right, folks, I've got most of this done for the day. The only thing I have left to do to the lower burn chamber, really, is to put the outer skin on it. Uh, I'll really quickly, I'll walk you through what I've done here and what it looks like. Underneath here, you'll see our dump gate mechanism. I just have a couple springs mounted to the bottom of that leg. That keeps the counter lever on this arm here, pulling the uh, bottom dump door shut for now. We're going to change that once we get the skin on there. If I look inside here, you can see that we have the coal gas extraction and the fresh air input chamber here, or system put into the bottom of the stove, right above the dump plate. Because when you're going to be wanting to run a generator off of that, or when fresh air is coming in off of that, either way, you're going to create a lot more of a burn density right there in that area, and you're going to want to be able to keep dumping the ash. Uh, so all I'm going to do here is grab that arm you see down there, and you can watch the uh, bottom 
Go ahead and open. So there you go, there's our dump. And it spring closes back shut, so if once you uh, see a kind of a carbonizing, you see anything building up, slowing down your draft or your air flow out, you can go ahead and open and dump that. We'll go ahead and set something up below the stove so you can catch all that dump dash, and that way it's not blowing around in the wind and it's safe, something that you could also put inside of a home. Uh, that's the only effective way to use a gasifier wood stove of this style design because the way they work is you actually light them from the top predominantly. Uh, once they burn down to the bottom, they can plug up, and so you've got to be able to dump this thing out from the bottom just like what you see there. Uh, something simple here you can add off of this. Now here's our coal gas and our fresh air input right here. I've got some wind going right at the camera at the moment. But you could take from here all the way down into a system like this. And this is a RV propane heater. It's a little tiny one from a small RV. And it's basically like an old oil heater. Two uh, radiator sections here with an output and an input. Here the input's actually kind of deep, has a large reservoir on it. So you could actually run into a T-valve right here, have fresh air coming in when you want it as an input, close that off, and now it's a draw system. This will catch your ash, cool the coal gas down, and basically from here with just a simple straw filter, you could run a generator. We'll incorporate this later into the design just to show you from this output. So there you go. There's basically almost all the work done on our uh, large burn chamber at the bottom of the reactor system. We've got our dump gate. All I'm going to do now, like I said, is go ahead and put the skin on and I'll show you what it looks like from there and we'll start building the upper crude reactor and move on from there to the fractional distillation center and on to the bio crude uh, thermal cracking unit from there. Hope you enjoyed. This was Mr. Tesalonian and the Tesalonian Man Show. All right, folks, uh, Mr. Tesalonian back here again. want to show you some of the things we've gotten done now on the uh, gasifier wood stove ISIS system. Let me show you now I've got my skin on. As you can tell, there's a white skin over that. It's a really thin metal. You definitely want to make it out of something a little bit thicker than what I'm using here if you want any long-term usage. You know, something like this, you're still going to get a couple years out of. You're just not going to feel comfortable putting something like this in your house with this thin of metal. Uh, what this is, it's nice and rigid still, but it is the skin from the uh, hot water heater tank. I actually skinned it at the right height, and as you can see, wrapped it, weld seam right there, wrapped it all the way around at the right spot, to create a nice uh, skirt all the way around our wood stove interior system there. Uh, as you can see down in here, I've put braces right here that actually are welded from the stove to the uh, outer skin. There's the second one. And right here you can see the third one. There's our actual uh, stabilizer there, so it's not weak, it's not flapping at all. Keeps the gap between it the same all the way down. You can see now what we have here is enough of a gap that I can basically stick my hand in there up to my finger ends. So right up to about where my fingers hit my palm of my hand, that's about the thickness you're going to want for an air gap. That's all the way around the whole system the same. Uh, allowing for a pretty uh, unified air draw, so one side's not drawing better than the other. If you do that, you're going to always see a fluctuation or one side burning stronger. So the more accurate you can actually get these air gaps uh, on all sides, the more accurate this airflow is going to enter the chamber. Uh, so anyways, I want to show you the spring mechanism here that we've set up. As you can tell, I've just, off of our mechanical actuation rod here, I've taken a bolt. And actually welded that bolt to the bottom side there. It has the head of the bolt there. And I actually cut it off with the grinder and then welded a uh, washer on there. So it actually holds the springs right there in place as you can tell. And that gives us a really good strong uh, spring return on our system. I'll show you here. It's just hooked into a rail. And you, so you can actually expand it or contract it back towards the center to increase or decrease the actual pressure against the bottom dump plate. I've got a stabilizer and a strengthening rod inside of that that I welded in there. That way it's actually not going to tug against that little thin stainless there and, and warp it at all. So there's actually a strengthening rod there. I've just put these around as a squaring effect just to help square out the frame. We're going to skirt that still over uh, with another material. One of the things I wanted to show you here is just how easy it was to stick that skin up underneath. You can see there's a rim here on the old uh, dishwasher. So I just stuck it up underneath there and right now I just have it tack welded all the way around. You can see here 
when it comes to the third side that, or the fourth side where we don't have any of the air draws, at least not exposed, we have it actually just tack welded for now all the way up the whole system. So there you go, that's how I put that on there. Now one of the last things when we flip this over that you'll be able to see is this pipe right here. That pipe, that half inch piece of uh, iron pipe, is drawing air right at the exact same height as the bottom ridge of this stove. And I'll show you where that goes when I flip the stove over. Uh, that actually is an air input draw to another line of holes on this side over here where we didn't actually drill any. Uh, so I'll show you that here in just a second. All right, now if I look in here at the top, I told you about that pipe and I showed you the opening of the half inch pipe underneath the stove at the bottom. There's where that pipe comes into the inside uh, burn chamber here. You can see I've drilled a bunch of holes in it all the way across. They're slightly smaller in diameter than our holes on the side here. Uh, I was trying to bank on the fact that that single draw will create a higher pressure through a smaller hole. Our air volume may not be high enough for larger holes. And I've also plugged the end of the pipe off right here. I've welded a cap on there so that no air comes out the end. So all the air that's flowing all the way up from the bottom of the stove where I showed you at the just below the height of the base there is now flowing up that side coming out here and will actually help a uh, create a nice burn zone over that side of the stove. And that's our uh, dead side which I showed you. That's the one that doesn't have any holes. Uh, actually that's going to be something we needed to do anyways because the way the shape of the uh, this uh, dishwasher case was. It was a little off so I wanted to make something a little different here. You also want to extend now possibly, we're going to do a test burn, extend a pipe just underneath this out and possibly right here into the center. It can be a straight line pipe like you see there with two sets of burn holes, uh, one on either side that'll draw fresh air in from the bottom of the stove also and make a complete burn area in the very center of the wood mass right at the top up here. We're going to do that test fire like I said and if I see a dirty burn zone or a dead burn zone in any aspect right here in the center of the stove, I'm going to go ahead and bring in one more pipe like we've done in the shop system. I'm going to bring it in right from underneath that right to the center. Uh, in the shop we actually have a circular distribution place uh, right here, a plate that's two plates with a gap between them and some uh, press ridges. A lot like the uh, burner, in fact, uh, from underneath a propane hot water heater which I was looking at earlier to use for this if we're going to have to put it in there. So let me go ahead and stick some wood in this. You can see now also that I've welded in the bottom. Everything shuts once again here real quick. I'll actuate the lever. You can see the dump plate works nicely. If I let it go, you can tell how tight those springs are. It should hold a pretty good amount of weight. But the nice thing about the design is there shouldn't be a lot of weight right there. There's just going to be some heat. Uh, this is actually going to funnel as like an A-frame does with snow. Funnel some of that pressure off to the sides or push it towards the center which will help funnel it off to the sides and not be a large heavy mass directly on the doorway there. Uh, so like I said, let me fill this with wood. We're going to fire it up and we're going to take a second test burn of the Isis Lower Gasifier Burn System. Alright, so I've got a small load of wood in here, a bunch of fine material on top to get it started quickly, and we've got some sm uh, larger wood down at the bottom. I don't want to overfill this until I've done a few burns. I want to make sure everything's working right. I'm not melting anything down. Uh, so what you see here, kind of something I threw in there just to see how it'll uh, introduce oxygen to that center mass of the wood there at the very top. I put this pipe on there. I just have some rocks holding it in place. You can see it draws air from way down below the stove like the other pipe. Uh, this will actually just throw a bunch of air, actually ranging a little too far into the stove to see really how well it's going to work. But you should see a flame that's rolling right out past this. Uh, so another thing here is I've got a squirrel cage style or a... Uh, uh, heater fan, exchanger fan for an RV here. It's 12 volt powered reversible. So at one moment you can power it one way and it blows air into that bottom burn uh, input system and then you can reverse it and now that input system reverses, you're drawing the coal gas or syn gas out of there and now you can put it through the radiator once again and out into your generator. Uh, this will allow us to increase our burn temperature pretty dramatically which might be necessary when we're thermal cracking uh, this bio crude or creating the bio crude in our original reactor. 
So there you go. That's just something we're going to add on. I'm not going to fire it up for this fire yet. I want to do a cold, uh, non-forced air fire. And then the next one, we're going to actually do a forced air and see uh, if we're not going to melt anything down with this. Because you can actually get these things up pretty hot. Uh, gasifiers can range about 200 or 2,200 degrees. If you introduct uh, fresh oxygen, a pure oxygen into the burn chamber, you can actually get it a lot higher than that and actually refine uh, tin cans and other metals down to a molten uh, state which is called a molten bed gasifier or liquefied or stratified bed gasifier. So anyways what we're gonna do now is after we've got this thing fired up we're gonna go ahead and uh, do a second burn like I said that's gonna be a forced air burn we're gonna push this thing right to its max without meltdown and see what the temperature output we can achieve is we won't do that until we get the upper cowling on this uh, we won't be able to tell exactly what the funneling because when you have your cowling above this it actually completes the draw cycle the thermodynamic cycle actually gets more uh, intense drawing more air between the two walls and out these holes uh, helping burn even hotter so let's go ahead and fire this thing up and see how it's gonna do all right, so here we are. We got our ultimate fire starter there. Good old toilet paper. We're gonna hit that with the lighter real quick and just see how quickly this thing starts to react and become a gasifier. It should take it a little bit of time. This is a really large burn chamber. So it's gonna actually have to create heat between the two walls here. Once that heat really increases, the thermodynamic process will increase and the pressure out these holes will start getting greater, reaching further into the burn chamber, hopefully giving us a complete burn. So here we go, you can see just how quickly that fire started. It's unique to start a gasifier since it is lit from the top. Definitely not the same process we're used to. You can tell already, if I can get a good angle here, those flames are already getting pretty tall. The air draw system is working already creating a uh, flow of some gas, you can tell there. All right, very little smoke right from fire up, which is also really nice. Good indicator, let me get out of the light here. Good indicator to its burn efficiency. Uh, that center pipe there should here, as it heats up, start creating a burn reaction right in front of it. All right, so that's good dry tinder I use. It's obviously starting fast. That's what I wanted for the shot here. Didn't want it to take a little while. Immediately now we're rolling probably a good three and a half foot flames, if not longer. And as this gets going, those flames should just start increasing in height. Uh, we should get up to probably a good six at least, I would say, if not better. I'm gonna have to stand way back from this angle, go around it. All right, once again here, I'll give you a kind of a horizon view from the... There you go. So you can already see there's quite a big flame rolling out of there. Very clean. You notice there is no smoke rolling. That means gasification takes place at a, a very fast rate in this stove. It doesn't sit there and tinker for a while trying to build up and then finally start the process producing a lot of smoke waste on initial fire like fire up on like other systems I've used. All right, so now our volume of flame, the actual dimensions, uh, circular dimension of the flame is actually getting much bigger now. We're getting gasification effect. So let me go ahead and shut the camera down here for a moment and we're gonna just let that thing build up and I'll show you just what size flames we roll out of there. All right, just to show you here just what gasification is doing. Right here you might be able to see in the shot the really dirty looking smoke color right there. But if I back up out of that shot, you're going to see that none of it is actually present in the, in the smoke. It's actually just all flame once it reaches up past the gasification point there, the air combination point. Now we're getting flames that are ranging probably nine foot. I can't actually get the whole thing in one shot. So let me see if I can back up here. Some of those gusts were getting pretty tall. There you go, you're starting to see some pretty good stuff there. That was a big one in there. 
little difficult on aspect ratio when you're watching it on camera, but those are huge hot flames roaring out of there. This thing's just starting to fire up, really. Uh, that was uh, the initial I showed you, and then I let it sit for a moment. You can hear the sounds coming out of there if I can get close enough without melting this camera down. Or if that wind changes on me, I could be in some real trouble here. All right, yeah, like it just did there. So we're gonna go ahead and back away from this thing. Just go ahead and let it burn. I'm gonna show you just what kind of flame column we can get out of just some sticks. So there you go, that is a monster flame column coming out of there. An incredible amount of energy for such a small amount of wood. All right, folks, we finished that test. I wanted to put the stove out because it was showing signs of uh, getting close to right before meltdown stage. Discoloration everywhere and it was turning bright red. So I went ahead and threw the lid on it. Uh, the team brought the hose over and stuck it in the top and right now we're just draining it out. It was a really successful test showing that this stove is not going to probably need too much fan forced air. Uh, to get this thing up to full temperature. The center burn looked just fine to me. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and put the cowling on this thing. Remember to do this, like I said, in steps. You wanna do a fire up. When you put your skirt on this thing, it's an incredibly different burn than when you don't have a skirt on it. The air pressures that are created up between that air gap are, are pretty high, especially with such a large burn chamber. Uh, so there you go. I'm gonna go ahead now and let it dry out. We're gonna go and start building our upper cowling off of it and we'll go ahead and throw our big reactor barrel in the top until next time I hope you enjoyed this is Mr. Tesalonian and the Tesalonian Man Show hi folks Mr. Tesalonian back here again we're working on the ISIS gasifier system as you can tell here I've got the upper reactor barrel uh, firmly mounted on a really unique piece that I found here that works just for this and that piece is the RV tire holder off the back of an RV, an old 70s model. It has this nice little pull uh, cable to that release down there. It locks on the plate right here, so when you pull it all the way down, it locks into place. But what this will allow us to do is both fill that barrel and to dump it. This will be something, because this barrel is much bigger than the five gallon can, you're not going to want to try to lift that up and spin it into place. So let me go ahead and pull that down for you and show you what it looks like all the way down. You can just reach up. Pull it over, and it'll actually stop when the latch first touches. So you give it a little push through there, and uh, now the barrel's sitting in place. Let me back up and show you that. All right, so there we go. We're gonna now work on the cowling system. Uh, that's gonna actually be attached to the barrel itself. Uh, that cowling, when in, in place, is gonna come down, sit right against the rim top of the wood stove, completing the air draw cycle and making sure that there's no leaks right here in the middle. Uh, what it'll do is go all the way up around the top of the, the reactor barrel here, and we'll have an exhaust port out of that, which we'll use in the end also for another part of this project. Uh, another part of this, which we had an issue with originally, was that I didn't finish the blocking on the bottom of the skirting. So let me go underneath and just kind of show you here the blocking that I've put down underneath there. And as you can tell, it's all squared off. I've got one big draw hole over there in the corner if the light will pick it up. Okay, there we go. Uh, so you can see I've now squared it all off, welded it up to the bottom of the wood stove on the back side. That's actually a plate going across and then one going up behind it. It's a nice squared off feature. It's about, uh, if I can get my hand aspect right here, right? Anyways, so about that thick. Uh, and all the way around. So our three sides are now all boxed in, ready to go. Uh, I'll actually put a sliding door over that hole here and one more over here and one on the opposite side so we can individually regulate each one of our burn sides and control the temperature of our stove system. So there we go, we're ready to go now. Other than the cowling and now to work also on the lid. This lid, I may originally just to do the first fire up videos, I may just use the lid standard. It's got the ring around it that came with the barrel. Uh, I'm trying to look for some pieces that I can actually make a seal down pressure lid, something that's not going to leak at all, that you can open and shut to be able to fill it. When back here, what we'll do is probably go buy a uh, piece of 8 inch or 12 inch uh, all threaded pipe, just a little section of threaded pipe, 8 inches around with a cap. It's going to cost about 200 bucks possibly for those pieces, they're not cheap. Uh, so I'm going to go look to see where I can find one. And that way, when you lift the barrel all the way up, once again, let me go ahead and pull that little cable. 
So you just reach in here and we'll have some little neat system built from the outside to actuate this so you don't have to actually reach your hand inside the wood stove. So there we go, we got the barrel all the way back. And when you do that, we'll be able to open that cap in the bottom of it. And that'll allow us to clean it out, drop all the ash out of it. It's also going to allow us even another neat thing. When the barrel's set up this way, after you've already used it in the reactor, what's left over in there is biochar. Uh, what this will allow us to do is when we open up the cap in the bottom, we can put the pipe out of the top. I'll have a pipe input to go to a generator, and this will become an updraft. Uh, biochar gasifier. So we'll actually be able to run a generator even, even another time after the initial uh, gasification reaction, the reactor reaction takes place. So we'll actually be able to open it up, light the fire into the biochar at the bottom, and it'll become an updraft gasifier going into an, our, our generator once again. So we're going to get multiple burns out of this. Yeah, multiple generator running points all the way through the system in the end. We should be able to hook up at least three generators to this when we're all done with it. Well, I hope you enjoyed. Until next time, this is Mr. Thessalonian and the Thessalonian Man Show. Hi folks, Mr. Thessalonian back here again. We got a little wind today, so you might hear some in the shot. I want to take you through, before I put the outer skin on the upper part of this frame, what it looks like, how it works, kind of from a distance, and I'll walk you up close, show you it, uh, how I built it, everything all together. Let me go ahead and just show you real quick here one of the neatest things about this and to be able to shut it down so that it's an all the way shut down outer case around this thing is that I built a hinged door here. So you actually lift that up and you notice there's a rod hanging down here. That actually goes up in there just like that. So it actually holds that door up into place like you can see there. Let me walk around and pull the barrel up. So you go ahead and once again, I haven't finished the last setup. You just pull the latch pull the barrel out and there you go you've now got the system you, you'll be able to have a roof over the top of it when you've opened it up you can also remove that they've uh, just got hooks with some screws in there on the hinge I'll show you that up close so there you go there's the outer frame ready to go to put the skin on you can see now that we can fill our barrel up once it's removed from the uh, inner part of the burn chamber uh, so let me go ahead and pull that back down real quick just to show you it in action again so you pull your barrel back down, it locks into place, you come over to here, pull your hinge down, and there your door comes all the way down. And once again, once the, the sheeting's on that door, it'll completely seal it off from the outside to the inside. So let me go ahead and take the camera up close and kind of go piece by piece just how this is set up. All right, folks, I want to do just a walk up here, just trying to show you exactly what we've got going on inside this system. Uh, you can tell it's just a bunch of squared tubing I've built the frame out of, uh, some other channel steel here, some C stock. Uh, what I've done here is you can see these square tubings running all the way across and it's welded off against the face here. I'm going to pull the barrel out of there. I'm going to show you what's on the other side of this piece of square tubing here. Uh, this piece of square tubing, you notice there's a hole. I can stick my finger up in there. That now runs all the way up, all the way over to the top, and once again is sealed off over here at the edge. And if I zoom in on the other side there, you'll notice there's a bunch of drill holes in there. All the way across the top there, and that's on both sides. So that's actually on this side too, which I'll show you from the other angle. Uh, what that allows for is air draw. We'll have some uh, opening dampers sitting right here so we can actually adjust the airflow up each one of these sides. That'll allow us to adjust so airflow will come up and actually mix with the gas up here at the top above the barrel, any excess gas, and actually create a heat zone on the other side of the barrel. So we've got a heat zone below the barrel, and now we'll also have a burn zone taking place up above the barrel, helping distribute the amount of heat and the reaction heat that we have penetrating into the barrel. Instead of being one directional or only on three sides, this will now give us a really heavy burn up above the barrel also, uh, helping create the pressure more evenly inside of our reactor. Uh, also here, you'll notice, if I can get that to zoom in, you can see it. On this pipe right there, there's also a bunch of drill holes going across it. And that, once again, is going to feed air right there at the top front edge of our burn chamber. Uh, right there at the top edge of that barrel. It's because that's going to be the lowest point in the roof up here. The framing up there, what you see, is actually the, uh, the roof line. That's actually where the skin's going to sit up on top of. Uh, so anyways, that'll feed air in there, and that's actually got a hole saw 
hole drilled in right here into the square tubing and then that hole feeds air directly out of this upper piece of tubing all the way across from both sides. So there's a fresh air feed with a bunch of holes there across that pipe all the way across the face of the upper piece of square tubing, uh, the longer piece up there and also across this longer piece right here. Now also you notice there's this center piece of square tubing uh, this is a different draw. You notice it stopped right here. I still have some holes to plug up in this, but that's going to be capped there. Uh, what I did also is drill the hole saw hole here, put that piece of square tubing up into it, welded it on, and on the other side of it, where you can't see, I'll pull the barrel out and you can see what that looks like, is I have those same holes drilled all the way across. And what that'll allow for, if I back up here, is that'll give us a burn zone right in the center. So what I've done with these different uh, pilot hole setups all the way across, these oxygen feed zones, is create multiple points of heat, or burn zones all the way around the entire barrel, trying to distribute heat as evenly as we can uh, all the way around to help create a better burn cycle inside of that barrel. So let me go ahead and uh, show you our input here. You can tell I've just got a T welded in there, a black iron T. That feeds air into that side and to this side and those both rise up uh, right into that center tube only. They'll be cut off above that so the air is only going into the center tube and that's the same over here on this side. Once again going into the center tube. Now when I pull the barrel you're going to notice that this tube here and this tube over here are offset from each other. I didn't want to put an exact burn zone directly on either side. I wanted to create a slightly different burn zone on the other side. It'll actually create a different cycle around the barrel. Uh, having them just slightly offset from each other will create a thermal cycle around the barrel that'll help spread that heat a lot more evenly. Uh, so anyways, there's our inputs there. I'm gonna, like I said, put a damper across that so we can feed the air evenly up into the top holes up there. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that barrel back just for a second. All right, now that I've got the barrel pulled out of there, I'm going to show you all the different burn zones. And if I show you from this uh, angle here, you can see just how offset those two center burn lines are. It's only by a few inches, but it's just enough to create a, a cycling effect inside of this inner chamber, this burn chamber around our reactor. So let me go ahead and just show you here. We've got holes drilled. Let me zoom in. You can see we have the holes drilled once again all the way across the piece of tubing, just like on this side over here. Uh, we have the same thing going on here. If I can get over there and kind of show you that. Kind of hard to get in there at that angle, but you should be able to see some of the holes there. So once again, we've got multiple points all the way around the barrel now. We have the lower burn taking place down here inside the chamber. We've got the gases rotating out around the barrel, and the gases are getting confined right here at the center because there's a smaller air gap here than anywhere else. And as they get confined, there'll be fresh air being mixed right there, and you should see a burn zone taking place right above that. And any of the rest of the gases that are not used up inside of this system will reach up here to the top, and more fresh air will be mixed into that system, creating another set of burn zones on either side and one here across the front, helping create almost a, a burn layer layer all the way across the top of the barrel and that should give us a nice even reaction inside of our barrel to produce the elements that we're looking for. Uh, so let me go ahead and set that back into place. Alright so let me take you through real quick here on some of these extra pieces and parts, uh, the little add-ons that I've put on there. Uh, you can tell here just the hinge that I've built is just a piece of circular three-quarter pipe. I've bent the rod all the way around it. I have a stop piece sticking off so it'll actually bump against the uh, metal there and, and let you know that you're at the right point. It's wedged just a little here so when the rod sits in the right spot it actually wedges in and kind of locks into place. Uh, some of the bracing that I've put off here from the old tire holder from the RV is just steel tubing bracing going to the barrel and that's on either side. And both on the top here and on the bottom, same thing. Some square tubing stock left over from the rest of the cuts. Uh, I've also reinforced the back of the stove where all the weight is. Th uh, the quarter inch piece of L stock going all the way across the back of the stove here, which most of the bracing's welded off of. I've also got some front and back uh, rigid bracing here off of this to keep it from pivoting back and forth and flexing the steel, and making it a little stronger. Uh, some of the other stuff here, let me show you the hinges. Uh, the hinges are just bent around pieces of iron and then maybe if you can see up in there I've got a little bolt uh, with a wing nut that keeps it from coming back off. 
and that just holds on there so if you ever want to remove the rear door it's easy to pull it back off of there uh, the rod itself is just caught inside of an angled piece of pipe with a cap on it the angle helps create a wedge in there and uh, holds it nice and tight so it won't come out as easy as a flat surface in there so that's just something simple you can use uh, just to hold that rear door open so that's most of the uh, parts. One of the things here you see in the front I haven't completely finished yet is these sections here are actually going to be the face or the door that we're going to open. I'm looking for a piece to run across the top still and that'll allow us to be able to have a nice big door that we can open up here in the face. Uh, until next time, I hope you enjoyed. This is Mr. Teslonian and the Teslonian Man Show. All right, folks, Mr. Teslonian back here again. Uh, we're working on the actual reactor barrel now in the ISIS gasifier project. I'm going to take you through kind of what I've got going on here, what I've installed. Uh, first of all, what we have is our main ash dump output here. It's just a large six inch collar that I've uh, cut a hole out of the interior here and welded that to it. That gives us something that we can dump the ash. It's also our air input when we run this as an updraft gasifier. And what I have here for the actual plug for this is a uh, six inch threaded insert cap here that we can actually just throw into place and there we go. That'll give us a nice uh, seal on that and also gives us the ability to open it up pretty easily. Uh, the oversized caps actually are very difficult to find a wrench or anything that you can get onto because this will actually get some tar and actually because of the heat and the corrosions and other things could become difficult to undo. So you're going to want something you can actually put a nice wrench on to get that thing off of there. Uh, the other side of this here, there's our gas output section. And what this is, just to show you, is a, uh, a coupler. And this coupler allows for this section of pipe to be hooked uh, directly off of another one of these going to our fractional distillation column uh, that we're going to use to first distill out the different uh, agents that we're looking for here out of the bio crude reactor. And that allows you to just come straight up to it. You don't have to actually spin the main pipe. You can just spin this collar. It's a little difficult to do one handed here. Uh, but that allows you to go through there and just Hook that together nice and tight. I'll take that off for now. And you got a good gas seal all the way across. It's something we can move out of the way. We're going to have a second one of these actually sitting right over here somewhere just off to the side of the barrel and the door. Uh, that'll actually hook to our fractional distillation. That will release uh, the coupler there also. You can swing. Once you undo this one, you'll be able to swing it out of the way and then pull your barrel out of the inside of the stove. Uh, let me go ahead and walk you around here real quick. Oh, first of all, uh, just a quick uh, addition to the frame here at the lower section. You can see I've put some steel pipe welded from the very front legs to the second dairy legs and all the way back out here. Uh, these are slightly angled towards the inwards here, uh, towards an inwards direction, giving us more of a centered uh, focus going to the outside. You know, so most of the mass is actually distributed right here in the center uh, when we pull this barrel out. So I'm going to actually use that center mass focused off of that and spreading it out a little bit. Uh, that'll just help us when we pull the barrel out of the uh, stove and fill it full of wood. That gives us a lot more support. I'm actually going to still install one more bar here. And that bar is going to run right here from the center of this low, uh, rear bar. And it's going to come up to right here. It's going to actually secondary brace off of this, which will give us a nice, when this comes out, when the barrel comes out and pivots off of that on the weight, it flexes this point downwards. Uh, no matter how hard I try to do it here, you can see especially some weight in it. So by adding another brace running all the way down, we'll be able to strengthen that pretty well. So let me go ahead and walk you around here and show you what's going on inside the barrel. First of all, I have a little excerpt video that I'll show you what's going on behind that uh, triangular plate in the back. Uh, it's our air output, our gas output goes in there and it's designed just to make sure nothing can get in it. So real quick, I'm just gonna flip the screen up here, a little bit of noise. This is our actual, i give it a second, there's our actual uh, separation screen. That's why those uh, braces are going across both at the top and at the bottom there. Uh, that allows for the screen to sit on that when the weight from the wood's on there. And what this will allow us to do is actually keep the actual wood mass uh, away from the bottom of the, the barrel itself, allowing us an uh, open gas area for the gas to go out. And also when we use this as an updraft gasifier, uh, when we open that large plug there, it allows for the air intake to spread all the way around the bottom of the wood mass or the biochar at that time and be able to draw it evenly up and create a nice burn zone. Uh, so that's easy to put in. It's just got a handle here. You can actually pop it loose. 
pull it down and remove it. And that gives you the ability when this is flipped upright to open up the lower plug and clean it out efficiently. Uh, it gives you an easy ability to do that. So I'm gonna go from here real quick and just add in the end little clip of what's underneath the triangular piece. All right, folks, here we are. We're looking down the inside of the barrel. We've installed the uh, ash out or air draw in for the biochar gasifier, and we've also got our gas out pipe here. And I'm gonna install a piece. It's uh, basically a safety device uh, right here. This is gonna create a uh, safety block between our gas out and us filling this uh, barrel up, because you definitely don't want anything getting inside of that tube up there and blocking that completely off. If that was to happen, uh, why this was in full temperature at full run, this could become very, very dangerous. We're also gonna install a pressure relief valve into this that I'll show you how to make. But you can see here, if I turn this, you can see we've got about a two and a half inch depth of walls coming up there. And that's actually gonna sit just like that. Uh, right to the back, it'll create a nice draw where my fingers are down here at the bottom. It'll create a nice draw and the angle this thing sits at when we have it open will also make sure that that's still at the perfect angle so material's not flying up inside of there. So this is a safety measure so that our gas pipe output doesn't get blocked up. So let me weld that into place and I'll show you that from there.